Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you, you can all hear me. Um, a very warm welcome to the Lundbeck Foundation Brain Prize Plenary Lecture. Um, my name is Martin Meyer. Um, I'm the director of the Brain Prize, and it's a, it's a real privilege to welcome today's speaker and winner of the Brain Prize in 2020, Professor uh, Huda Zogby. Um, and the Brain Prize is currently the world's uh, largest prize that's dedicated to neuroscience and it's awarded each year by the Lundbeck Foundation to one or more researchers who've had a really groundbreaking impact in their field. And the Brain Prize recognizes advances um, in any area of neuroscience from basic to clinical. In 2020, uh, the Brain Prize was awarded to Huda Zogby and also Professor Adrian Bird uh, from the University of Edinburgh. And they were awarded the prize for their work on Rett syndrome. Um, specifically for um, the demonstration of the role of MECP2 in Rett syndrome and of epigenetic regulation in regulating brain development, but also maintenance of a normal function in the adult brain. And I think um, for me at least, the most remarkable aspect of their research is that it's really challenged the idea that um, disorders such as Rett syndrome are irreversible. And Huda is um, a professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Molecular and Human Genetics, Neurology and Neuroscience at the Baylor College of Medicine. She's also a, a Howard Hughes investigator, and she's director of the Yan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital. Huda's work quite rightly has been recognized with many other awards and accolades in, in addition to the Brain Prize, including the Breakthrough Prize, the Gruber Prize and the Gairdner Award. Um, I promise to keep this introduction short um, so that there's plenty of time for questions at the end, but there's, there's one piece of housekeeping. Um, so if you'd like to ask questions and I, I encourage you to do so, please enter them into the Q&A box. If it looks like we're about to run out of time and your question hasn't uh, been addressed, please transfer it across to the Q&A or the chat box, I should say, where Huda will join you and you can discuss those, those questions online afterwards. Um, so with that said, I'd like to hand over the, the virtual podium uh, to Huda Zogby. Thank you, Martin, for this very kind introduction. And it's truly my honor to be giving the Lundberg Foundation keynote lecture at this wonderful meeting. So today, what I'd like to do is share with you our work on Rett syndrome. And it would be a journey from the beginning of what enticed me to work on this disorder to where we are today. So to start with, my interest in Rett syndrome was inspired just waiting here for the slide to move. Uh, John, I can we move? I, I don't see the slide moving. Okay, now it's moved. Uh, my uh, interest in Rett syndrome was inspired by seeing a patient that presented early on with healthy development and subsequently lost her milestones. You see her here leafing through a book and using her hands very effectively. And then on the next slide, you see, uh, John, I don't think my clicker is working. Would it be possible for you to advance the slides, maybe? You see her here riding a rocking horse, again, capable of doing that, functioning quite normally, uh, up to two years of age. And then shortly thereafter, she lost the ability to communicate the ability to uh, walk, and as you'll see on the next slide, the ability to use her hands. So you see her here constantly wringing her hands, and that's a huge change. And what intrigued me about this disease is that this early period of normal development was really, you couldn't distinguish her according to her parents from a healthy child, and she was able to, see, to say words yet eventually she deteriorated and lost motor ability, use of hand and all language. And just about the time I've seen her, Ben Kagbrook described this syndrome in 35 other girls all like her, no evidence for neurodegeneration. And I happened to see another girl a week later with the same phenotype. And that's really what interested me in Rett syndrome. I wanted to understand how could a disease that's not degenerative and you're not born symptomatic, 
how could that happen? How could that affect the brain? So with that, in the next slide, I decided that perhaps one way to solve this mystery is to go after the genetic causes of RET syndrome, find the gene, and maybe that would help us. But as you'll see here, RET is a sporadic disease. It's typically one of the family. The vast majority of the cases, it's just one in a family. So it's almost impossible in the late 80s to really map and clone a gene for a disease that spread. The genome wasn't mapped, we didn't have marker, and that simply took uh, a challenge. And we kept looking for the rare familial cases and we only had a couple. And we narrowed the hypothesis to be that threat must be on the X chromosome because they're all females. And with that, and with eventually brute force sequencing genes on the X chromosome till we find the right one, uh, next slide, in 1999, we were able to identify the gene causing Rett syndrome to be actually on the X chromosome in the XQ28 band and to encode the protein called methyl CPG binding protein 2. This work was done by a postdoc in the lab, Ruthie Emir. And on the next slide, you will see that this protein was initially recognized and discovered by Adrian Bird, the co-recipient of this prize, and he identified it as a protein that binds methylated cytosines. And this was in 1992, and we knew that it binds methylated cytosines that were followed by guanine. And more recently, next slide, we learned that this protein actually also can bind other cytosines if they don't have to be followed by guanine, but even being followed by adenine or other cytosines, it can bind. So we call that non-CPG methylation. And that mark was discovered by Joe Ecker, Lister et al. and Joe Ecker, where they discovered that in the brain, post-birth, post this mark continues to increase and uh, even into adulthood. So this really connected the increased levels of MACP2 protein after birth, the slightly later onset of the disease, and this mark all happening postnatally. And that became of an interest to us. And more recently, a postdoc in our lab, Laura Lavery, compared the consequences of losing MACP2 in inhibitory neurons and of losing the writer of this mark, the DNMT3A, in the same neurons, head-to-head -head comparison, and found that there's quite a bit of overlap, suggesting that a significant portion of the pathogenesis of Rett syndrome is actually mediated by the binding of this protein to the non-CPG mark, the MCH mark. And also recently, Adrian's lab showed that another methyl CPG binding protein could not substitute for MACP2 uh, as well, suggesting again that it's really the MCH that's really important. So what have we learned since the discovery of the gene? And on the next slide, you're going to see that the majority of Rett syndrome cases have a mutation in this gene. I told you that Rett is on the, the gene is on the X chromosome. And I think most of you are familiar that every female has two X chromosomes, whereas males have one X. So for males and females to be biologically equal in every cell of a female, one X has to be inactivated. This way, they only have one X expressed in every cell. And typically, it's random. Half of the cells will inactivate the maternal allele, half will inactivate the paternal allele. So if we look at this cartoon, you'll see the brain with half of the cells being blank, which means lacking a functional MACP2, and half of them have a nice dark staining saying they have a functional copy of, of MACP2. So that 50% mosaic brain uh, will be enough to give you Rett syndrome. If you just lack it in 50% of the cells, that gives you classic Rett syndrome. And the next slide, you'll see what happens in males. In males, where there's only a single X chromosome, when the gene is mutated, it's going to be lacking from every cell, and that's quite severe. These males have severe encephalopathy, seizures, motor problems, and sadly, they would die by typically the second year of life. However, what we've learned throughout the years, and that's the power of identifying a gene that causes a disease, is now you go beyond the known 
phenotype, which is classic red, and you start looking at patients that have partial symptoms or even other symptoms. And as you'll see on the next slide, what we learn is that there are milder mutations. Here you see the, the staining is pink, which means the protein is functional, but not 100% function. It has reduced functional capacity. And in fact, many of those are males. So these are males who can survive with a mutation because the mutation is milder and they will grow into adults. And typically, in addition to mild learning disability, they will have any one of these colored features. They may have autism. They may have anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorders or bipolar disorder. And some have juvenile schizophrenia. So you notice now when we're getting into the realm of a milder mutation, we are now uh, starting to see more psychiatric features than when we we're in the realm of severe mutation where we see, sorry, motor features and, uh, and seizures. So on the next slide, um, I'll share with you what happens if you have an extra copy of the gene. So you've seen what happens in the gradation of the phenotype if you lose a copy of the gene. Here in a mouse study, a graduate student and Collins in our lab wanted to ask what happened if we overexpress this gene. So she added one normal human copy under its own regulatory element, and that piece of DNA only contained the MACP2 genes and all of its regulatory element, but no other genes. And to our surprise, these mice that had twice to three times the normal level of the protein had autism-like behavior, anxiety-like behavior, and many neurological features, as you see on this slide, and even premature lethality in certain genetic backgrounds. So this discovery made us wonder if there are humans with extra copies of the gene who might also present with progressive neurologic disorder. And in fact, in the next slide, you'll see that Linda Vanesh in uh, in Belgium, discovered many such patients and reported in, on boys with duplication spanning this gene. They also have additional genes duplicated, but this is typically the gene. This and another kinase are the two genes in the minimal region that's duplicated in all patients. And they, they cause a progressive neurological disorders very similar with, it, with its phenotypes to the neurological features we've seen in our mouse model. So this suggested to us that definitely doubling this gene is toxic to neurons. And on the next slide, you'll see what happens to neurons that have either no MACP2 versus excess MACP2. You'll notice that they give opposite features. In the middle is a wild type neuron from a hippocampus glutamatergic uh, uh, cell. And you'll see in green the synapses labeled. And on the left, you'll see neurons from a MACP2 null animal lacking the gene. And you'll see decreased number of synapses. And on the right, you'll see that doubling this gene level causes enhanced number of synapses. This is work of Tuan Chao many years ago. So we wanted to ask molecularly what happened. And on the next slide, you'll see that even molecularly, the loss and the gain are inversely opposite of each other. So this immediately told us that the gain does not cause disease by interfering with the normal function of the protein or with its normal complexes. It told us that the gain causes disease by just doing much of the same of what this protein does. So with that information, I'll move to the next slide and share with you what we've learned throughout the years. We've learned that you see the white circle in the middle for brain health. You have this protein at exactly the right 100%. If you have a milder mutation like the alanine 140V, typically we get mild learning disability in males and one or many neuropsychiatric features. We also learned that in animal models, if we decrease the protein to 50%, we also get neurological phenotype. I told you about the red or plus minus females and the male null severe. On the other side, doubling the gene, I shared with you the phenotype. We also learned triplicating it or increasing levels further, both in humans and in mice, gives a more severe phenotype. So with this background then, recently we became interested in what controls 
this gene? What controls the level of the RNA and the protein? Because for something so tightly regulated, there must be more than one way to control it. So on the next slide, um, I'll share with you our studies on transcriptional regulation. And to do this, we went into data that's generated by one of our colleagues here at Baylor College of Medicine, Joshua White, who was performing ATAC-seq, which is, uh, this is a uh, looking at accessible regions in our DNA that may be sites for transcription factor binding sites. And he looked at these peaks where there may be enhancers or regulatory elements in the developing brain, as well as the postnatal brain, as well as the adult brain, as well as liver tissue, which I'm not showing you here. So we became interested in the peaks that are in the adult mature brain, because we know this is when this protein is really important, but also less so conserved in, or not present in the liver, because we know loss of this protein is inconsequential for the liver. And if you look at the adult brain tracing, you'll see multiple peaks labeled one through six. And you'll notice that peak four is quite intense in the, in the signal, which tells us that there's a lot of transcription factor binding sites here. And this is already was known to be the promoter of the gene. Uta Franca and others have shown that this is the gene promoter. So what we became interested is, in is those other peaks are they important for the transcription and RNA level regulations of MACP2? So on the next slide, you'll see our approach to determine if those are important. We decided to take an in vivo approach because we knew we wanna look for functional deficits, behavioral, psychiatric, neurologic deficits. So we decided to use a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, deletion approach to delete individually each one of these three peaks in mice and characterize the animals. And on the next slide, you'll see what we learned. First, we learned the deletion of some of these peaks. For example, if you look at peak two and with the Western blot right above peak two, the peak two is the column in blue, you'll see that the MECP2 level is reduced compared to the wild type control. You see reduction in the protein and the quantification is at the bottom. And on the other hand, if you go all the way to the end, the red bar, you'll notice the deletion of peak six increases the protein. And as you'll see on the Western lane above it, you'll see that decrease. This is work was done by a graduate student, Yin Yao Xiao. On the next slide, we then asked, are these two peaks conserved in human brain? That work was in mice. So we went to human brain data from Jeremy Nathan's lab. He has published ATAC-seq on the human brain uh, tissue. And we found that these two peaks are indeed conserved. So we used human iPSC-derived neurons, uh, uh, human-derived neurons, and we deleted those peaks genetically, again, peak two and peak six. And you'll see again here the peak two knockout in two different uh, clones of uh, stem cells differentiated into neurons. You'll see a reduction of the protein, whereas in the peak six, you see an increase. So now that we know these two peaks are consistently evolutionarily conserved, really important for the regulation of the protein and result in somewhere in the 30 to 40%, 50% perhaps change, what do they cause in the animals? And I will, instead of walking through a lot of behavioral data and gene expression data, I'm simply gonna summarize to you the data. Next slide. What you see here is uh, we know that 100% of the protein is healthy. And we know 50%, as I mentioned to you, will cause phenotypes in the mice and red mice are mosaic. And you see in the big oval, all the features we typically see in red syndrome, from motor deficit to learning and memory seizures, et cetera. What we discovered is the peak two knockout, which consistently gave us about 70% the level of the protein. So it's about a 30% reduction in all animal studies. What we saw is it only gave us a partial subset of the phenotype, hyperactivity, anxiety, and social deficit. It didn't cause motor problems, no seizures, no learning and memory deficits. On the other side, 
if we were to look now what happens when we increase the protein, next slide, we use, I shared with you that doubling the gene causes a multitude of neurological problems, again, seen in that big oval circle, but uh, oval, but when we only increase the protein by 50% due to the peak six knockout, we saw partial features. We saw hypoactivity, anxiety, and learning and motor deficit. So this was really quite interesting, is that that gradation in the level of the protein, it isn't that it's gonna give you all the features, but milder. It tells you the different brain regions are differentially vulnerable to the threshold of the amount of this protein. And this by itself, it's quite interesting because it's gonna suggest that, uh, next slides please, that milder mutations may actually cause psychiatric phenotype. So if we now populate this curve with these new data, you saw that 70% uh, uh, level of the protein will give you mild phenotype, whereas 150% gives you also increase, also a mild phenotype. And the next slide is where we think that neuropsychiatric phenotype might be somewhere between 100% and 150% on the increase and somewhere between the 100% and the 70%. So that really raises the flag that very mild mutations may make someone susceptible to psychiatric diseases. Next slide. So now I'd like to move to the other side of our study. That was the, our molecular studies. Now I'd like to move to our neurobiological uh, studies. We wanted to understand what's, what's the role of this protein in neurons. Anytime we learned quickly, and these are all summarized multiple studies by various members of the lab, we learned that anytime you delete this gene from any particular neuron, you get phenotypes. Interestingly, the inhibitory neuron gave us the most phenotypes, and the excited neurons also gave quite a bit of phenotype, whereas all the other subtypes gave one or two features of the disease. The only surprise came from the cerebellum. Although the protein is highly abundant in the cerebellum, in fact, compared to other tissue, it's highest in the cerebellum, for one reason or another, any deletion from any particular cell type did not cause a phenotype, but only a deletion from the horse cerebellum gave us a very mild phenotype later on in life. So this is intriguing. We're going to dig deeper into this to understand what protects cerebellar neuron from the absence of this protein. But seeing that there's so many molecular changes, as I've see, shown you with the gene expression changes, seeing that there's so many neurons that, de neurons that depend on this protein, we quickly realize there's not an easy fix for this disease by manipulating one neurotransmitter system or manipulating one gene that's misregulated. So for that, we wanted to ask perhaps, and we actually tested that. We tested boosting the level of this protein in inhibitory neuron or in excited neuron. We get a partial rescue, but that is not sustainable. The system will eventually crash and all the symptoms will appear. So we knew that you cannot selectively activate only one neuron. We thought it has to be the whole circuit. And on the next slide, I'll summarize a short story that we've adopted to, to test that. And that is to explore circuit stimulation. In this case, we wanted to focus on learning and memory and see if that changes the activity uh, of that circuit. And one thing I did not mention is that in every case when we delete this gene, we render the neurons partially less active. They basically function at about 70% of their normal capacity. So there's a 30% or so reduction in their activity uh, when they are dysfunctional. So here we thought if we stimulate the fornix, which has projections to the hippocampus, maybe that will boost the hippocampal activity. And Shuang Hao and Zhang Tang, our collaborators here, did this work. And you'll see on the next slide, they followed the same deep brain stimulation parameters that are used in humans by a neurosurgeon. And they did this in adult mature animals who are symptomatic. They did this at two months of age in the female rat mice who are symptomatic by that, at that time. And then they assess for every hippocampal phenotype we see in these mice. And as you'll see here, the animals had fear conditioning, motor water, Morris water maze problems. 
and uh, synaptic plasticity problems, decreased neurogenesis in many gene expression studies, abnormality. And on the next slide, we summarize here, because this was published, all of these corrected, all of the features corrected. So it was a beautiful rescue. So we knew then that the red brain, at least in mice, is responsive to neurostimulation. And we wondered, would this be a path forward? And it could be, but there are many features of red and motor symptoms are quite disabling in red syndrome. So we wanted to ask, could we do something? We will test DBS for motor activity, and this is ongoing, but we wanted something that perhaps can hit many features of red syndrome because eventually to stimulate every region of the brain is going to be challenging. So for that, next slide please. We asked, would intense behavioral training enhance the circuit activity and improve red phenotype? And particularly we're interested about whether the timing of this training is important. Next slide. The reason we were interested about the timing because we knew already from previous studies uh, cited here that early enrichment did improve the function in red mouse model. But what we didn't know if that early enrichment, the timing of that early enrichment is critical. What if there is no comparison to early and late and how does that enrichment help? So in the next slide, you'll see how we chose to do that. First, we wanted to look at motor coordination because that's a phenotype that's disrupted in red. Next, we wanted to train the animals on the rotating rod either before they're symptomatic at eight weeks of life because we knew their coordination is impaired at 12 weeks of life or after they become symptomatic. And please advance to the next two slides. Next one. So what you see here is we did two types of training. One early pre-symptomatic training and they get 18 session and one late post-symptomatic training, they also get 18 sessions. So this way at least it's not the amount of training, it's just the timing of training. And on the next slide, you'll see this really makes a difference. So you'll notice in black here are the wild type mice they all will stay about 200 uh, seconds on the rotating rod. The naive red mice in gray on the first, on the left, you'll see they fall immediately. The late training causes some improvement, but nowhere as good as the late training. So this told us that early, uh, as early training, this told us that early training significantly improves the motor function of the mice. Next slide. We next wanted to test another behavior. When we tested the animal on other behaviors, they did not improve. They only improved on the rotor rod. So we wanted to take a different domain, in this case, learning and memory, and asked, would the red mice now find a platform? You'll see on the left, a wild type mouse. When you put them in the Morris water maze, they quickly find the platform with four sessions of training, but the red mice don't. So show me the next three slides together. Right, perfect. What we did here again, because the swimming learning spatial phenotype happens at an earlier time point, we started the training here earlier at four weeks of age. And you'll see we did the training now once a month. So it wasn't excessive, but we gave them 12 sessions of training versus those 12 sessions happen after the symptoms occur. And on the next slide, you'll see that this also made a big difference. Notice here that the wild type animal in blue, naive, when you put them in the Morris water maze in a few days, in four days, they can find the platform. In red, the naive red mice at the top, they really can do that. And the same is true for the rate, late trained red mice. That's in purple, they also do poorly. However, in the bottom, you'll see this repetitive training in the uh, early trained mice, now the brown, similar to the wild type trained mice and the wild type late trained and early trained, they, they now all do very well. So the early training in red mice make them perform as good as the wild type in finding the place of the platform. Next slide. In the Morris water maze, after you, you do the training, you take out the platform and you ask with the animal spend more time in the quadrant where that platform was. And the red line shows you chance because there are four quadrants. They're gonna by chance 
spent about 25% of the time in any quadrant. And you'll see here that wild type animals spend 50% of the time in the right quadrant, whereas naive and late trained red mice, it's chance. However, after the training, now they're spending more time. And if you go to the right, even the platform crossing area, that means they really learn there is something here. You'll see the early trained mice do remarkably better compared to the late trained mice. Next slide. But these data told us that this is only true in the Morris water maze. If we put them in another spatial learning paradigm, they don't do as well. So that immediately made us suspect that maybe when we're training it, we're not improving the whole hippocampus as we did with deep brain stimulation that stimulates the whole circuit. Here, what we're doing, we're engaging them in one activity and perhaps only these neurons that are engaged in that activity is what's improving and gaining the plasticity. So we wanted to test that hypothesis. And on the next slide, you'll see how we tested it. We basically, next, went to a system developed in Lich and Lu's lab where we can trap or label or capture the neurons that are engaged in the activity because once these neurons are active, they'll immediately express the immediate early gene FOS and that will drive expression of a Cre recombinase, which in the presence of a reporter, in this case, TD tomato, we're gonna put, or we can put our dread receptors will turn red. So when we give tamoxifen, next slide. So you notice here on the left, the animals who are just handled, you don't see any red, but on the right, when they're put in the Morris water maze, you can actually label these neurons and trap, trap them with any marker you wish. Next slide. So now that we can label this uh, activity or uh, action, if you will, stimulated neurons, we can now express uh, the specific re the specific dread receptors that either inhibit or activate these neurons. Because, and these were developed by Brian Roth, and we can use CNO to either silence or activate these neurons. So this is chemogenetic uh, manipulation. So next slide. On, on this slide, I'm just simplifying. I'm not showing all the controls. On the top, we took the early training and we didn't express the uh, inhibitory dread. We simply expressed uh, cherry, red cherry. And you'll notice that the animals should be able to find the platform because they had this early training. However, at the bottom, now they express the inhibitory receptor. So the neurons that were activated in the task with repeated training, if now they're silenced, we wanna see what happens. And the next slide shows you what happens. You'll notice that for wild type animals with M. cherry and red early trained animals, they do equally well. You'll see them here finding the platform quickly. On the right, you'll see that when we inhibit these neurons in the red animals, they can't learn anymore. The wild type animals recruit probably new neurons and can still learn the task. And the same is true for platform crossing. Only early trained red who do not receive the inhibitory dread can find the, research, the platform and cross it while as those that have been silenced lose that ability. Next slide. Now we wanna ask how about if we don't put the animals through training, but simply stimulate these neurons, what would happen? So in this case, we put the animals in the pool and we simply give them the one session to activate these neurons. But instead of early training, we take them back to their home cages and simply now use the activator dread and give them CNO and activate these neurons every month for two months and see what happens would they learn. So on the top, they didn't receive the receptor. We did not express it because it's a creed dependent receptor. They should not be able to learn at the bottom if really activating these neurons is training them to become uh, more receptive and plastic, they should learn. And the next slide shows the data. So on the left, you see both wild type animal and red animals. If they have not been trained, but simply 
if they have not been trained, they're not going to find that is uh, the, the platform. But on the right, if they have been trained, they perform and stimulated. Sorry, if they have been, these neurons have been stimulated, they'll do very well. Again, you see the wild type and the red performing well and the crossing of the receptor. So these two data together told us that it's really those neurons that are through the repeated training becoming activating, pushed above their slightly, if you will, disabled properties to now perform better. Next slide. So here we asked if we change the properties of the neurons, and I'm going to show you these two slides. Next one. Uh, we, we can label them so we can look at their dendrites and synapses and quantify that. Next. And because the red is mosaic, you're going to have some red MACP2 positive cells and MACP2 negative cells. Next slide. So on this slide, you will notice that uh, the left are the controls, the green and red. Let's look at the bar. We did show analysis to quantify their dendrites. The MACP2 positive neurons, they're the third lane on the right, without training or late training, they look fine. But you'll notice that the late trained MACP2 null neurons do very poorly. And only after early training, you see, you see the improvement. Next slide. And that's true also for both their excitatory uh, postsynaptic uh, post current and their inhibitory postsynaptic current. Both of these parameters, again, you see the MACP2 null cells very poor, almost to the floor, and you'll see after training those early trained neurons improve their synaptic function. And that's just within that short period we looked at. Next slide. So in summary, what we learned then is that pre-symptomatic training improves motor and memory deficits in the red mice, but in a task-specific manner. And this continued training, I didn't show you the data here, it actually delayed the onset of the phenotype by months. And the task-specific neurons mediate the beneficial effect. Lastly, we learned that pre-symptomatic training also improves the physiology, the synaptic function of the neurons and their morphology. So we think this has some implications for Rett syndrome, as I show on this slide. Next slide. As I mentioned to you, Rett girls typically have normal development. If you look at the red line at the bottom, the Rett girls appear healthy till about 12 to 18 months of age, and then they regress and then lose their milestones. The average age by which a molecular diagnosis is usually made in a red girl is three years. So we have three years delay from the time they were born till the time we know they have Rett syndrome. Uh, what our question is, if we had newborn screening and we implemented, we have to do clinical trials where we implement this repetitive early training that's task specific and do the sequences with different tasks so that all the different types of neurons are engaged and repeatedly trained, would that delay the onset of Rett syndrome? And hopefully, even if we delay the onset by year or make their functionality a little bit better, they would be then perhaps even more receptive for new therapies as they become effective therapies that are more holistic, that treat the whole syndrome at its root, that would be a great thing. So this is something we're proposing because early training is really safe. We're not putting any of these children in danger and the data could be compared to the thousands of patients who've been having natural history data. We know what the trajectory is. This could be really helpful. Next slide, please. So in the last seven minutes or so, I would just like to share with you what we have done on a therapeutic front for the duplication syndrome. If you recall, I mentioned to you that our mouse model is very nice to reproduce many of the features of MACP2 duplication syndrome, particularly those due to MACP2. So given that here we have an extra dose of the protein, we asked with normalizing the protein level help. Next slide. So to this end, we decided to use antisense oligonucleotide and collaborated with Payman Jafar Nijad and Frank Reed at Ionis Pharmaceutical who prepared these screened for the appropriate antisense oligos 
and prepared some that target the human gene. So in this case, we have one human gene and one mouse gene. We're simply eliminating the human, so the mice will always have a normal copy of the mouse gene. And you'll see on the next slide that this indeed was quite helpful. Hesse Steinberg, when he was a postdoc, did these studies. This is one example of uh, all the behaviors rescues. Here's one example of a behavior rescue where you'll see activity is decreased. The gray bar are the transgenic mice, and you'll see compared to the white bars, they are less active. And look at the panel in the middle of the bottom, you see less activity. But when we give them the ASO, you see that in orange, their activity, their rearing, their entry to the center, all of that improved. And this was true for all the additional phenotypes that these animals have. So we started here the treatment at about two to three months of age, and we wanted to ask, next slide, what would happen if we start the treatment at seven months of age, much later, seven to nine months of age? In, on the FVB background, these mice at seven to nine months of age has, have seizures continuously. And you can see that by EEG, you can see that by um, uh, videography. And this is very typical, sadly, of also the human patients. Typically by seven to nine years of age, all the human patients will have seizures. So next slide, you'll notice here the EEG recording from a wild type animal. And in the middle panel, you'll see the recording from these duplication mice. And what was nice is that after four weeks of ASO therapy, the seizures stopped and the EEG normalized. And this happened actually in every animal. So this was quite exciting in that it told us that not only behavioral phenotypes are reversible, but one of the most devastating features of the disease, the seizures are reversible, and even at a very late uh, stage of the disease. And as you've heard from Martin, this is really complementary to also what Adrian Bird has shown, where he genetically reactivate or re-expresses the, the MACP2 gene in female rat mice and in male mice and sees improvement in their behavior and function. This is where we think this protein has a maintenance function. And we know that function has to stay because we know when the ASO wears off, the symptoms will return. So one has to give repeated uh, treatment in this case. Next slide. Now, I, I told you in the first study we used the original mouse model with one mouse gene, one human gene. But in humans, there are two human genes, two or more, and they're identical. Therefore, one has to find a way to regulate the dosage of the ASO so, to, so as to avoid decreasing the protein be, below 100%. So we created a new mouse model. We call it our humanized mouse model. This work was by Yin Yang Xiao with Hezi Steinberg and just got published a couple of weeks ago, where we find these mice have doubling of the protein. Next slide. And what was really important is that in a, we can titrate the ASO doses. So you'll see here in a dose-dependent matter, you can normalize the level of the protein. And therefore, we show that you can actually dose this just as you would dose blood pressure medication for hypertension or insulin for uh, glucose, one can actually titrate this dose to, to get the desired level. Next slide. Uh, when we followed the level of the RNA and the protein, we found something interesting. What we saw is that in red is the original MACP2 RNA on the top. You'll notice that within one to two weeks, the RNA normalized you'll see that the RNA normalized immediately within one week of therapy, and it's gradually crept up. However, if you look at the bottom, you'll see that the protein did not normalize within the first week. It actually took two weeks to normalize, and that's the protein level at the bottom. So there was a lag between the RNA normalization but the protein normalization. Here, since we're starting we're calling 100% the 2x, so we're going to 0.5, which means we're going from 2x to 1x. So this told us there's a little lag between the RNA and the protein. Of course, you have to normalize the protein to get benefit. And on the next slide, you'll see the summary of all the data from this study. You'll see that uh, the RNA normalizes by one week, the protein by two weeks, 
all the gene expression changes that are downstream from MACP2, those took about five weeks to normalize. But what was interesting, at the time all these gene expression changes normalized, the animals still had all their behavioral deficit. It took about nine weeks after therapy for the behavioral uh, rescue to occur. So there is a lag time between having a perfectly normal protein level at two weeks to having now behavioral rescue. And this is both interesting and important. It's interesting because it tells us we have to figure out what's happening to these neurons over time. What needs to happen to them for the function, the behavior to, to be rescued? It's important because it tells us we have a window of opportunity to monitor the exact level of the RNA and the protein before any consequences and symptoms happen. This way, if we find that we over-treated and we lower the protein instead of to 1x to perhaps 0.8x or 0.5x, one could use an antisense against the antisense as an antidote, or one can adjust the next dose because you immediately learn that very quickly before even symptoms develop. So this is quite exciting, and these data provide the proof of concept now to begin thinking of clinical readiness and clinical trials. Next slide. So to summarize then everything I shared with you today, uh, I, we sh I shared that both loss of function mutations and duplications spanning MACP2 cause Rett syndrome and MACP2 duplication respectively. The milder mutations, as well as small changes in MACP2 level, as little as 30% change can cause neuropsychiatric phenotype. Antisense oligonucleotides against MACP2 mRNA can reverse the phenotype in adult duplication mice. And this time lag, as I mentioned, allows us between normalizing the protein and behavior for monitoring the ASO dose. Lastly, pre-symptomatic training improves the neurological functions as well as morphology and synaptic function of task-specific neurons in red mice. And I hope the safe strategy could now be implemented as soon as uh, you know, one can design uh, such studies. My last slide is the acknowledgement slide. And here I'd like to thank uh, all the members of the lab who've contributed to this lab, I mentioned them specifically as I went on. The top of the list is Ruthie, who, through her perseverance, sequencing gene after gene for three years, she was able to find the Red Syndrome gene. And then all the contributors to the work I mentioned as we went along, my collaborators, particularly our computational biology team, Zhen Dong Lu and Zhen Rong Tang with the DBS studies, and Josh with ATAC-Seq and Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And most importantly, my great thanks go to the Rett syndrome families who really patiently worked with us till we found the gene. And now the maybe two duplication families who enrolled in the studies, particularly the clinical readiness studies that are so important. We're very grateful for all the families, not only for their enrollment in study and their patient, but also for support. They all work hard to raise funds to support the research in so many labs. And lastly, our funders, Howard Hughes, the NIH, and RSRT 401 project that funded the ASO studies and the recent work on the uh, uh, enhancers and the uh, pre-training, the Henry Enger Fund and Keck Foundation for DBS. Thank you very much. I think I have one last slide to show you where I live. That's where I work. Great, Huda. Thanks very much for a, a fantastic uh, talk. I think the science is spectacular, and, it, and it's very nice to end on such a hopeful and, and optimistic message. Um, we, we have a few questions coming in. So we have one from Mohammed uh, Haji Hosseini, who says, "Thank you for a great talk. What is known about the degradation and turnover mechanisms of MECP2?" Excellent question, Mohammed. Thank you for this. Uh, we have we're doing. I talked about transcriptional regulation of MACP2. We also have done study post transcriptional, looking at polyadenylation of the mRNA, and last but not least, post translational. So as you can imagine, post translational modifications will tell you about ubiquitination, its regulation, 
and what factors might regulate it. As of now, we've done unbiased screen to find those factors, and we've identified a couple of ubiquitin ligases that may be the ones that ubiquitinated. So we're testing that. We're still in the cell stage. We have to go in vivo. And we identified a protease that deubiquitinated. So when it's deubiquitinated, obviously it's stabilized, and that would be helpful for Rett syndrome. But if you inhibit that, then you, you will increase its ubiquitination. That's helpful for the duplication syndrome. Uh, that particular uh, ubiquitin-specific protease, we're testing if it is going to be meaningful in vivo as well. Super. Um, so we have another question from um, Emma, who says, really great lecture. Um, I was going to ask this question as well. What sorts of training would you implement in RET infants, and how do you address the compulsive repetitive behaviors? Excellent question. So I think that think about the training that you would implement uh, that are some of the things that normal infants would do. But now, instead of you let a normal uh, neurotypical infant, if you will, do it naturally or for five minutes, you'll focus on it more extensively. I'll give you a few examples. You could perhaps, instead of having tummy time for five minutes, every few hours in a neurotypical infant, extend that tummy time to perhaps 10 minutes or doubling the amount that you would do it to give them more core strength. You perhaps will work with them on sitting more rigorously, more repetitively than you might, because you, we let the neurotypical infant to take their own time and pace in doing things. But here, we really want to strengthen the core of red girls. That's the first step. And their motor strength, some gait training, rather than waiting for them to walk. Many infants, neurotypical or RET, will walk after 18 months, 18 months and beyond. Here, you may work on that a little bit earlier to gain some strength, to gain some tone. In the language domain, I can imagine, while we typically just you know, talk to babies at random and try to say a word here, you may want to sit and focus on few words that you do repetitively when they become language receptive eight months and beyond. And even if you end up with a vocabulary of 10 to 20 words where they could express themselves for a year or two longer, that would be great. So there are really many ways to do this. The key is two things, to have that regimented, to keep stimulating those neurons that learn that one word to say it again and again. And I think it's a little bit of a different regimen of how physical therapy is now done. So it will be a regimen change. It will be paying attention to various modalities. Super. So we have another question from Noor uh, Shaheen. Apologies if I mispronounce your name. It says, thank you for this fascinating talk. Brilliant as always. I was wondering how one can make use of MECP2 expression in a clinical context for neuropsychiatric disorders. Can it perhaps be used to improve diagnosis? Does it have implications in treatments or is this approach reserved for Rett syndrome and MECP2 duplication syndrome? Wow, what a, what a great question, or a really very interesting question. So I will break it down. I think, how can you make use of what we've learned today? I've shared with you today that in a mouse, 30% reduction of this protein or 50% increase is giving us multiple behavioral phenotype, autism-like, social, um, I'm not looking at, we can't really look at true psychiatric mood and schizophrenia in the mouse, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do have them based on the human patient with milder mutations. So that's in a mouse. The fact we see in a mouse with a phenotype with such a small change tells me, even if you had 15 to 20% change in this protein, you, you might actually see a phenotype in someone that's later onset that's more psychiatric. Therefore, the way we're going to have to make use of it is for us to really pay more attention to variants in this gene in people with psychiatric disorders and perhaps consider some of these evolutionary amino acids to test them functionally. Even if they change the protein by 10 to 15 or 20 percent, we better pay attention to them. So this is how I see it. I think you have to couple paying attention to the variants together with some functional studies. To your point, what 
based on what we've learned from Merit, how could this help us help these people? Let's say they're individual or vulnerable to psychiatric disease because of change in the protein level of this protein. I think I consider something such as cognitive behavioral therapy as really training of the brain. I think it's the same principle we did with early training here because these people are not as severe as a child with Rett syndrome. You can perhaps work on retraining these individuals with behavioral therapy to see if some of that could be overcome. That's one example. I'm, I'm sure there'll be other and maybe some medication is necessary, but I think keeping in mind everything we're learning where a slight change is going to slightly affect the neurons and we know repeat training of the neuron will make a difference that would be an approach i would take okay thanks huda so i'm not sure if we can run over time or if we just get cut at an hour but in, in in case we do get cut we have lots of questions please transfer your questions over to the chat so we can continue this discussion but um it looks like we can just keep going. Um, I think the technicians will tell us otherwise. So I'll ask another question. Uh, this one's from Noah Shapiro, who says, thanks for this wonderful talk. When do you expect clinical trials will start? So I think that for, for duplication syndrome, they're in clinical readiness phase right now where it's important to identify an early bio, the enrolling patients. And we're doing the basic work to find biomarkers that the first thing they change when you change the level of the protein. And I think if they can validate some of these in the human individuals, this would be the foundation for moving to clinical trials. So we're getting close for the duplication. And for the RET, of course, I think we have to consider the regulators and powers that be that early screening early diagnosis is important then one has then one can commence these clinical trials pretty promptly once you do because that's a safe treatment you know early training is safe and you compare that to the untreated girls in the natural history study um so trevor bushel says given the reversal of mwm i presume that's boris watermay's deficits it is uh, is it known if place or grid cells are preferentially affected in the MECP2 mice? They are affected, but I would mention many other cells are also affected, but we do know that they are affected. And we're doing imaging right now uh, to photon imaging, monitoring these cells during uh, you know, hippocampal activity, not in the Morris water mice, but other contextual studies, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, uh, one from Alan Palmer. Does oxidative stress play a role in the pathophysiology of Rett syndrome? I think there have been some data to indicate there's some mitochondrial uh, dysfunction and changes. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if it does contribute, but it's not the initial driver. Okay. Um, from Oliver Steele, we have excellent talk. Thank you. Exciting to see the progress in Rett's with MECP2, is there any evidence to suggest the same treatment methods may yield benefits in related conditions such as CDKL5 deficiency? Excellent question. And I would venture to say is probably yes, but one has to do the experiments in the model early and late training. We do know from autism, if you ask me what human disorder early training has actually made a better difference, and that is in autism with the uh, advanced behavioral therapy. So I think at least based on what we learned in autism and the RET model, this is promising, but as always, we need data. So I think it will be good to carry these data and these existing models. Super, so we have two minutes remaining. If I may, I'm gonna sneak a question in myself. What's so special about the cerebellum? I am trying to find out. Martin, it is intriguing. It's not the levels of the protein because the level is very high there. So I want to see if it is the chromatin state, if it is, we don't really know. So there's something that makes it more, or if it is some other protein that's maybe making up for the de deficit. We're in the midst, this is very recent data, so we're in the midst of doing these studies. Great. Um, so that it will help, right, for other yeah. Protein. For sure. Um, so I think we're pretty much out of time. So I'm just going to finish by saying thanks again, Huda, for a fantastic talk and joining us at the BNA. And congratulations again um, on the Brain Prize. Um, 
as I said at the start, please continue um, the chats afterwards. I think it's called the chat room or the chat box or something. Um, and yeah, thanks again, Huda. Thank you, Martin. Enjoy. You're welcome. Bye.